Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. Here we are for another episode of the Soul Seeker podcast. But before we dive in, as always, we'll just ground in with a few breaths. So if you're listening, I invite you to join in with us through breathing, but keeping your eyes open if you feel more comfortable, depending on what you're doing, all that those disclaimers as normal. Tracy, for you and myself and any of the listeners that would like to close our eyes, we'll just begin just closing down the eyes shifting from the chaotic and busy outer world into our inner landscape, feeling our feet on the floor, sitting up a bit straighter, and through the nose, inhaling all the way up, sipping in a bit more air at the top, and audible sigh. Big inhale all the way up, letting the belly expand. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Holding the breath for a moment here. And audible sigh, letting it go. Shoulders drop, let it go, let it go. And one last one. Inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Holding the breath here, continuing to just hold the breath. And exhale, soften, let it go. Just letting the breath return to its natural state and rhythm and flickering the eyes back open. All right, so here we are back again with Tracy T from Moms on Mushrooms. I think the first time we did a podcast together was several months ago. I don't remember exactly when I should, but it's linked in the show notes so you guys can check it out. You guys uh, definitely encourage you to check out the first episode or Tracy's stories if you're not already familiar with her amazing story of being a stand-up comedian to now educating moms specifically and women in general and being a pioneer in the psychedelic space for microdosing and maybe a little bit further with deeper medicine ceremonies as well. So with that said, Tracy, welcome to the pod. Uh, you might be on mute. So yeah, there we Thank go. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. I'm so flattered. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. And, you know, in the spirit of just transparency, it's so funny because we were scheduled to uh, do a follow up uh, interview podcast about a month ago. And when we did the last podcast, for those of you guys that might remember that listened, or if you just listened to it, whatever, towards the end, we got into some really good, uh, juicy topics like toxic positivity and what, what uh, other stuff like that. So when we went to record the last one, I was just kind of like, yeah, I'm not feeling that great. <laughs> and then it was funny because you were like, yeah, I'm not feeling that great either. And I think we both kind of were like, okay, either we could like push through, power through. Yeah. yeah, we could power through it and have a very interesting conversation about like toxic positivity when we're not feeling our best, which, which yeah. w- would have been 
uh, interesting, but at the same time, I don't know if you resonate with this, but I know for me when I'm not feeling my best, like it just feels like I'm not clicking on all cylinders, you yeah. know? Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, part of the fine line, right. But part of healing and part of recognizing your own limitations and who you are and how you show up in the world also means you have to like call an audible sometimes and shut it down. And, um, I think older versions, I'll speak for myself, older versions of myself would like be like, oh my gosh, you can't do that. Look, you're a failure or you're so weak and pathetic and self-serving. Um, and the new version of me is like, she doesn't feel good. It's probably not best for her to go on and like talk publicly about something, um, and of course there's limits with that, you know, we have to be responsible and keep up with our obligations. And it's so beautiful to be in this space because there's people like you where we can gather and we're just like, yeah, it's not great today. Let's just try it again some other time. And I think that's, that's beautiful. Cause then I just went back to bed. So I'm pretty yeah. sick. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. And it's, it's, Interesting if we could all interact in this kind of way, because I think in, no, I think I know in business culture and just, you know, collaborations as well, uh, albeit content creators or traditional corporate business environments, we typically are just powering through it. Um, but to what extent, for what purpose, you know, like, does it actually make sense? And uh, for me, I, I'm spending a lot more time in like companies and business culture and being like, how can mm -hmm. we change from the inside out? Mm -hmm. But as it relates to toxic positivity, so just picking up exactly where we left off, we were speaking about the Barbie movie and how that was such a good illustration of toxic positivity um, in terms of her leaning into it. I'll, I'll just hand it over to you to see what comes through and we'll just see where it takes us from, from there. Yeah, I think, um, gosh, there's kind of like three buckets that I think about. Um, that I've been thinking about since we talked about it. One is kind of what we just, you know, we just sort of discussed, but from a female perspective, the toxic positivity of um, like always putting on a good face. I'm fine. The kind of super woman, you know, super uh, feminine ideology that like, I'm, I'm beautiful. I'm skinny. I'm healthy. I'm smart. I'm capable. I'm successful. I'm a great mom. I can do all the things. I never get tired. That, that's one bucket. Um, then there's this um, spiritual psychedelic bucket that you and I intersect in. That's the love and light. Everything is fine. Um, oh, you know, just trust. Um, I had a conversation about that recently. You know, just trust the universe. And this kind of like can get a little bypassy of just like everything is going to be fine and while on some levels i understand that but there needs to be a groundedness that allows you to actually show up as a human and and do certain things um and we can talk about that and then the third one is i think actually deeply comes from religious connotations of um and like the toxic positivity that can come in, in, in like Christianity or Catholicism or other religions where everything is just like, well, it's the will of God, or uh, I have Jesus. So therefore I, I can do this, this, and this. And, and, um, and then inside that you kind of can go two ways. You can be this like lowly sinner, and then you're just sort of always pathetic in the eyes of God. And, um, never able to kind of be empowered by yourself or on the other side, um, you're forgiven all your sins. So therefore you just can kind of like be an asshole and not really be accountable. Um, and I think all of those come into toxic positivity. What do you think? I <laughs> yeah, I, I love those buckets. I, I didn't go so far to create like buckets or archetypes. Uh, I love that. That just kind of come through after we spoke last time. Or yeah, yeah I mean, I've been playing with it for a while just like thinking about yeah yeah i've been kind of playing you know, with it for a little while 
I would say the, the we can work backwards and unpack them a bit. And the third being the religious, the will of God, Jesus is here, support me. And it, it can also get into like a spiritual bypass type of way. I mean, it is, right? Um, that is the one I'm least familiar with. Obviously, I'm not a woman and I'm not a mom, but I'm very familiar with the first bucket and the second bucket. Um, the third bucket in terms of the religious one let, let's start backwards from here and work our way uh, to the first one you made. But the religious one, are, did you grow up re, uh, religious? Is this something that you experienced firsthand? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. But I also, maybe I can like even broaden it a little bit more into saying that it can be almost like an identity that we glob onto that somehow because I'm X, it justifies Y. Mm. And inside that, I think that positivity comes i think i think positivity is even interesting because it can it can show up in the form of like not not being accountable for your actions um and the positive part comes with like well i have i'm this thing i'm this identity i'm this uh belief system so therefore i can just say these things or do these things does that make sense maybe i'm overcomplicating it no, it makes total sense. Um, if the delineation between buckets two and three seem like they're similar, the difference they might is, be. One is your own belief systems and the other is like you're kind of indoctrinated into a certain way of believing and you're not necessarily thinking for yourself. And that could be a projection. I grew up Jewish and for me, um, and going to temple and religion and all that, it was, I always resonated with like, um, my my heritage and it was nothing against like judaism but i just didn't resonate with organized religion yeah. so I, I for me that's the difference between religion and like spirituality you know totally and spirituality you know as we're as we're kind of seeing can a lot of times turn into its own religion you know that's how yeah. cults form and and these practices like these rigid ways of doing things you have to do it this way or these repeated mantras you know just using love and light as like the classic toxic positivity mantra yeah. um they can become their own dog you know religion is really just like the application of dogma right because there's a set of rules and if you don't follow these rules you're not you're not adhering to uh the projected outcome of said religion or dogma right you're not going to be enlightened you're not going to be saved you're not going to go to heaven um and so they they do they do definitely cross over i just think it, it whatever lived experience um you know may it may resonate from one connotation versus the other for sure. And, you know, I, I don't often get visuals, but uh, us talking several times, I'm just having this flash of uh, Ned Flanders come through <laughs> from The Simpsons. You know, uh, if we were to like, this might be a fun little exercise, like find a relatable like character. We can like, obviously the first bucket we could say, well, not Wonder Woman. She's not a mom. We'll get there. We'll get there. I promise. Yeah. But the yeah. third bucket, um, Ned Flanders, right? He's always happy. He's kind of like preaching his stuff onto other people. And mm -hmm. it's just like, you can feel like th this isn't authentic. Like, does that feel kind of? Yeah. Yeah. And I would say Barbie. That's how we got started. You know, yeah. everything's fine. Oh my gosh. You're so pretty. Like it's not, you know, there's no room for, there's no room for dirt under your nails in those scenarios. Ned Flanders, like, would never acknowledge, you know, if, if he got a, a if he got a snag on his sweater and his sweater was unraveling in front of him, he wouldn't right. even allow himself to be like, oh man, that was my favorite sweater, you know, because it yeah. would totally derail the entire thing that he's trying to maintain. I, I see a new uh, Simpsons episode coming <laughs> soon. Good thing uh, my homie Al Alex Ruiz was on that production set, but not anymore. All right, so third uh, religion, we got that uh, two spiritual. We we talked about the gray line a little bit and all is love and light. Now I'll, I'll share experience for me. Like when I started down this path with spirituality, um, I was never like, oh, all is love and light. You know, it just, it, I, I've never, and even still to this day, you know, being a male and coming from more of like a meathead bro -y type background mm -hmm. or whatever, there's still a lot of conditioning and programming, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of feels and words and things like that. Yet I would say 
I was very much like um, embodying more love and light versus talking in the flowery language, if that makes hmm. sense. You know, how did and, you embody it? Um, that is a great question. And now that you're asking that question, I think this leads to where I was go where I was going with it. And I think I thought I was embodying it, but I think <laughs> okay. what really what was happening, uh, what I mean by embodying is I was uh, doing my best to embody at the time with the tools I had and understanding yeah. of like, you know, love and light and don't want the darkness. That said, I had this like dark shaman experience. It was mm -hmm. uh, probably my third time doing ayahuasca or something. And that took a while to integrate. And it felt like the darkness came for me as a teacher because yeah. I was so blocked off to it because I was like, why would you ever want to like intentionally go the darkness? Yeah. And I'm not talking about shadow work. I'm talking about like the dark horses type so mm. yeah I, I can hear i can feel you why you're chomping at the bit <laughs> let's let's see what's coming through for you well um yeah i mean there are like some of my teachers have taught about like noales and like like a like a shadow spirit animal and a darker spirit animal and i was just in oaxaca and we did an entire um exercise of acknowledging kind of our spirit animals because um in the Zapotec, in the Zapotec lineage, you know, it's very nature based. It's it's you know pagan in just a different culture, um, and so all of nature is a teacher, right? So we really looked at animals and and earth elements as as teachers and guides, and how how we um, how we go towards certain ones versus the other and then also what are the shadow teachers what are the teachers that we're scared of what are the teachers that trigger us what are the animal and what was the animal that triggered us and I had to really think about it and I was like well what's the animal that triggers me because I feel like you work enough with this medicine especially if you kind of are practicing the more shamanic medicine way I'm like I've kind of made peace with like all of nature right like I don't kill spiders anymore I've, I've had a lot of deep journeys involving snakes and come to terms with that. And what I realized is the big trigger for me was a rat, like rats mm. scare the shit out of me. And I feel like they're like spawns of Satan. And so I had to really, so I had to kind of confront my fear of the rat. And then what they offered is that in doing this exercise, when we eventually went and sat with the medicine, is that it's likely that both of these teachers would show up for you and you would make peace and understand what those teachers are. So going into that dark place is incredibly important and avoiding it at all costs um, is like you're missing out on 50% of the equation. The other thing I just want to add really quick, because I'm curious what you think about what I said, but um, uh, for women... Um, I think a lot of us, like we talk about goddess energy and we talk about ascension and we talk about filling and showing our light. And I believe in all of that, like a thousand percent, but in some of the most transformational times I've had in medicine and even in contemplation and meditation by myself and with other women has been to, um, embrace and acknowledge like the dark goddess and the underworld and all the power that's under there. And that it's not that it's evil, that dark means something different, but it's, it is, it's a, it's a polarity of who we are, of the light and both have to exist. And so how do you like make, make peace with it? And I'm not saying embrace demons or Satan or anything like that, but there's a fine line there and we've just kind of forgotten all of that, I think, in like Western culture. I'm so happy you brought that up because, you know, um, I'll just call it like dark magic. You yeah. know, I think that's yeah. fair. Um, I, I'm not very well educated or versed on this, and it's not something I, I talk about publicly a lot, um, mainly because I'm a man and I want to mm. be sensitive to that. Um, this was something that came up for me more a few years ago. It's not really in my awareness as much these days, but I remember feeling uh, for sure triggered by uh, some of the goddess stuff, you know, mm. and, and, um, so the, all of this, like for anyone listening, like understand most, 
the majority of my friends are women, you know, and I'm very much all about like women's rights and all the things like I, the last podcast, we were talking about the Barbie movie, how it's one of my favorite movies, all the things, yeah. whatever. So I just want to preface that because I don't want anything to be like kind of taken out of context here. But sometimes when I've seen the, the goddess stuff in the past, it felt, and I'm, it could be a projection, but how it felt for me was, um, very showy, very yeah. expression, very dark. And there's other times when it feels, it feels authentic, you know, yeah. and in that dark shaman experience that I was alluding, or I mentioned, that was actually more of that, like dark arts, like goddessy type energy that we're talking about. And like I said, I don't talk about it too much because it's not anything, um, I feel like I, I'm really equipped to talk about. It's things that I've talked about with women friends, guy friends, you know, just whatever. And it's come up in the past. Um, it, and not to single out women. I mean, men don't really have an equivalent to this uh, that I'm aware of. And I think um, in terms of the goddess, like it's really good that women have this outlet and it's about empowerment. And I think there's to your point, another side of that where it is playing with the dark arts. And I think some of them don't know that. So not to single women out, they go back to that point. Um, the, all the tantric type stuff that happens where, you know, regardless of your sex or your preference or any of that, like all of that to me, I, I put under this category where I'm just mm. like, I don't know if that's resistance in me and that's something mm. I that ought to be leaning into. And when I felt into that in the past, I'm like, I don't feel called to that. I'm sitting with the triggers that come up. I respect your model of the world, but it's just not, it's, I don't understand it. I'm not going to judge it. It, you know, I, I sit with the judgments that come up, but like where mm -hmm. I'm at now sharing it, it's just like, I think earlier on the path, it was a, a bigger thing. And now I'm just at a point of like, yeah, I respect your model of the world, world, you know? Yeah. Um, can I try to like For sure. paraphrase some of that or contextualize it? I think that they're um, in the spiritual movement um, with regards to, we'll just stick with like specifically like this goddess and in and, and the kind of Tantra that's coming up and and becoming more prevalent as well some of it can be very performative and um i think one thing that women um were were beginning to unlearn it's so complicated because on one hand it's like we don't have to show up full hair and makeup we don't have to put on all the accoutrement to prove ourselves accoutrement to prove ourselves or to be um to to um, receive value. Okay. So we don't have to be, we don't have to look like a goddess to be a goddess, but mm -hmm. there's still an urge to show up in that way, um, to claim like worth. And even from an egoic place, like to get, to receive attention. And if you can pass through that, um, and this is something I've really been playing with on the other side of that is this like delicious, very embodied ex personal expression where you're like, I actually finally think I'm beautiful. I think everyone is beautiful and I can find beauty in everyone. And there is something to be said about like adorning yourself and embodying that, that archetype um, because it allows you to step into the energy a little bit more, but it's a really tricky thin line in the middle. And then on the other hand, it's easy to glob on and Tantra can become dogmatic too. Actually, Tantra can be very dogmatic. Like it's easy to glob on to one thing. And that's where you kind of go back into your identity and you're like, oh, I'm this, I'm this sexually empowered woman. And I'm, I'm all of these things. And it becomes your entire narrative. And you actually aren't potentially not being like a whole woman. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think what Tantra, the essence of it really asks for, and I think the essence of all of like, if we're just speaking about like goddess energy, um, and, and like the dark thing is 
all of it comes with um, what we need to do, which is reconcile our fear of death, you know? Mm -hmm. And when you can do that, then you are like, then you can hold death in your hand. This is Kali, right? Goddess Kali, who's been demonized. Like we just watched um, with our daughter, we just watched Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom the other night. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I didn't realize that like the whole section where they pull the heart out, you know, like the big, like they're, they're saying Kali Ma, Kali Ma, and it's all to Kali. And I was turning, you know, like her freaking crunchy mom, my daughter. And I was like, okay, so here's the deal. Kali is not evil. Like she's a, she is a vengeful. She has rage in one hand and empowerment on the other. She is avenging the deaths that of the wrongful deaths of her beloved while she is like offering enlightenment because she holds both in her hand. My Evie's just like, can I just please watch Harrison Ford? Um, but yeah. so we have to, I don't know. I'm, I think we have to like, understand that someone who can embrace death isn't evil but has actually reconciled their fear of it and that is what the underworld archetypes and all the mythology comes from but mm. from that you can actually go further and further away from it by just being like performing in this mindset um but you're not actually getting to the core of it i hope that made sense that makes total sense uh indiana jones movie which one was it the temple of doom the, temple the second doom. one. Oh my gosh it's so good uh, have you seen I, it years ago uh I'll, I'll i'm writing it down so i'll re-watch it yeah, i love movies and looking for these themes so uh, that's fun mm -hmm. i recently was at disneyland in la disneyland uh for a conference and we went to disneyland and went on the indiana jones ride um so i think it's based on that movie i was wondering because they go, they're one. going through a mine and everything they're running from these I mean, there's all sorts of art. I mean, there's like child slavery and child sacrifice and blood. Right. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff in there. I was just like holding my mouth, but um, yeah. you know I, had to, I had to speak up about Kali. Yeah, yeah, that, that's cool. All right, not to get sidetracked there. Yeah. So everything you were saying, yeah, that totally makes sense. And the reconciliation, the fear of death, you know, it's interesting because I find personally with myself and a lot of people I work with, like the deeper we go with plant and earth medicines, you know, especially ceremonies versus microdosing, like that fear of death just like is gone. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, what's fascinating about this conversation is we came in to talk about like toxic positivity and really what we're talking about isn't like if we, I've been doing NLP, right? So if we chunk up like bird, bird's yeah. eye view on this and go above positivity, we're, what we're talking about is the toxicity of wearing masks and however mm. that may manifest, you know? Yep. Yep. I feel that deeply. I think that's, I think you nailed it. That's what it is. It's masks, whether it's identity, um, whether it's your outward appearance, whether it's your political affiliation or religious, it's a, it's a mask and it's somehow it separates you from actual connection and it keeps you Ned Flanders style, You're like right. a robot, just repeating the same thing over and over. And you justify to yourself that like, that's enough. Mm -hmm. I, I did some absolutely a hundred percent. I did some research on this about a year and a half ago, uh, for a specific reason. And um, when, like a lot of us, a lot of people listening, at least my listeners, and I'm sure uh, if, if some people are coming from your audience, they would know about this as well. Like the body keeps the score, right? And how mm -hmm. we we hold on to our traumas and our emotions that aren't processed and all those sorts of things. And when we wear these masks, it can manifest into dis-ease. So the research I was doing last year led me uh, to find this thing called CSS, Central Sensitivation Syndrome. Mm. And many people that are like um, in physical therapy and spirituality, like mind-body connection type that are coming from a more body type uh, background, I've ran this by them. They're like, yeah, I haven't heard of that. I, you know, it's kind of a, a rare thing, but, um, I was researching fibromyalgia, not for me, but just, I was just um, thinking about for, that. Actually, when you said that, I was yeah. Like, oh, that's yeah. Keep so going. 
Yeah. So basically, and not to get into that story, but um, I was doing some research and then that's where I stumbled on CSS, central sensitization syndrome. And one of the things that it manifests as is fibromyalgia and fibromyalgia is that pain in the body that, you know, a lot of people think is made up and doctors and medical people don't really have a good answer for. So I'd love to hear what's coming up for you there. Well, it's interesting. I've had two conversations with really powerful medicine women in the last couple of weeks um, about fibromyalgia specifically and then pain in the body. And again, from a more um, earth-based embodied uh, earth wisdom perspective, people feel very strongly that fibromyalgia specifically is the culmination of just trauma that's locked in the body and that it is it's just it's it's pain body you know Eckhart totally calls it our pain body it's um but it's it's trauma that was has not been resolved and it locks itself in the body and causes pain and that when you make friends with the pain um or you acknowledge the pain and you work through the pain the pain goes away you know, and you can, you know, there's another like trigeminal, uh, trigeminal neuralgia, uh, same kind of thing. Um, and then there's other, you know, another conversation I had recently was just, which is very pervasive again, in, in more of the earth, earth-based like healing practices is that most pain, like 80% of pain can be resolved by acknowledging the trauma that you can relate to it. If you give yourself a chance to actually lean into it and think about it, not from an acute, there's pain in my side, but like, okay, what does that mean? Like you will, your body will supply a memory for you to deal with. And then about 20% of it is like actual pain. And it's not to say that there's not things that go wrong in our bodies, but a lot of it is can't, you know, it's posited to be, trauma that we haven't released a hundred percent yeah i couldn't agree more and part of this was doing more research around yeah. breath work you know and mm. in my new book i have a breath process which is very similar to what you mentioned like the breath acronym the e in and the acronym is energy to reveal and that stage is the shadow work it's like okay yeah. what is this energy revealing to me what's the story what's the lesson mm -hmm. to your point when we get curious then we can start to accept it and surrender to it then we can alchemize it into positivity so uh, yeah go ahead well i just want to say one thing because it just made me think of something so obvious from a mother perspective so when in 2021 my family's in like really bad car accident we were hit by a drunk driver and my daughter was in the car. She was nine, nine years old at the time. And so it's 2021. So we're, we're barely coming out of COVID insanity and just like, don't even get me started on how that jacked up our kids. Um, and then, you know, my family gets hit by this car accident. And in the months that followed, my daughter had debilitating stomach issues, debilitating. And, um, it would, it, her stomach just hurt. And when she would go to school and it would be a particularly crazy day at school, she would come home with a stomach ache. She, she wouldn't want to eat. And we pretty quickly identified it as we called it like stress stomach. Finally, I'm like, is it cheese stomach or is it trust? Is it like, did you just eat too much dairy or is it something else? And I think most parents are actually totally fine with identifying pain in kids. That is emotionally informed, right? I have a headache. I have a ton, you know, kids, their tummies hurt when they're upset and everybody is fine with that for a child, but somewhere between childhood and adolescence, we like let it go completely and just stopped listening to that. And then just decided that like all pain is needs like medical treatment or, or just needs to be ignored. And I just think it's really interesting because actually most people would agree that that kids have pain that's emotionally caused, but we don't agree when it's adults. That is fascinating. Yeah, that's it. so. That's something you've been feeling into recently. No, I just thought of it right now. Oh just, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. When you were talking about like the CSS and stuff, I was like, oh, you know, 
It, it, yeah, that's it. I'm not a parent, uh, but that's a wonderful thing about uh, being a parent because you can see so much. And I, I mean, I've been around a lot of kids recently, I would say, and especially like the young ones, like around five to seven age. I really love talking with them and just like there's they're just tapped in, you know, and to your point, the conditioning and programming of societies. And I think um, the more awareness we put around this, because science uh, proves this too. Dr. Joe puts out an amazing body of work talking about how the brain develops and gets into all the science of what we're talking about. Right. But then I feel like we're, what we're talking about is more like culturally, like, you know, the conditioning and programming that just happens over time. It's like, yeah, that stuff is going on in their brain and the hormones and development, but also now we're teaching them different and they're yeah. interacting different, you know? Yeah. 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 But it's, but we, um, at some point we all kind of collectively agreed that that can happen, that you can get a tummy ache when you're nervous or scared right. or sad. Mm hmm so it's in us still. We just don't want to bring it back out. Yeah. You know, you know, what helps me more than anything. And I, I share this every opportunity I get. So if it, I'll put it in the show notes, I'll make a note right now to put it in the show notes, but on Amazon, I have a refrigerator magnet that I bought. I've had it for over a year now, and it's made for kids. And it has a bunch of different emotions and feelings. And then it has a slider on top of it that says, I feel. So mm. then you just slide where you feel. Like, literally, I, I talk about this all the time. It's like, as adults, we need this. It's made yeah. for kids. But like, <laughs> I use that thing and I'm washing the dishes. I glance over and I'm like, how am I feeling? You know, or yeah. If, I've been working through emotional and binge eating. So before I open the fridge and just like numb and distract what I'm feeling, it's like, wait, let me check in first. Am I actually hungry or am I avoiding uh, something and trying mm. to just, you know, eat my feelings? Mm -hmm. you know? Gosh. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's simple things. Right. Right. And then, you know, to bring it back to like toxic positivity, our culture, like there's a, you even had to preface it, right? Like I use it all the time, you know, it's made for kids. Like, why is it made for kids? And like this idea that we're not allowed or that it's somehow silly to stop and actually be present for a minute. I'm not even a minute, like five seconds and just check in and say, what am I doing right now? How am I feeling? Like, how, how am I showing up in this world? And like, from what motivation does it come? You know, food is just a really beautiful example. Then you can go into wine, you can go into mm. drugs. And what? why is this in my hands? And just asking yourself that question, let alone like, how am I feeling? Yeah, yeah you know? exactly. And that, <laughs> that's something I've been working through with everything you uh, mentioned. The two big ones for me have been food and cannabis. Uh, you mm. know, a lot of times being like, Am I am I checking out with cannabis or am I using it as a tool to dive in and check in a little bit more? Because I'll tell you, last year when my life imploded and it was uh, challenging, I, I've never used cannabis like I did last year. You know, I thought I did, but to just go in and then lay in my bed and then just put on binaural beats or nothing at all and just ask the tough questions, you know, like that, it, it's an amazing tool. Yeah, cannabis... Yeah, she will, she'll rock your boat if you ask, if you are, if you're willing to ask the questions. Um, Sarah Hope, like a really dear sister of mine and, and teacher, you know, she always says that like cannabis will kind of match you where you're at, right? So True. Um, if you want to party, cannabis will show up and party. If you, if you want to go in and you want to really get and work through some stuff, like she will meet you there and she will dig it up and out. And I've absolutely experienced that with cannabis. And if you don't know what the hell you want from cannabis and you're just doing it to numb out, like she will just be like, okay, bye. And she will only just give you that thing. And it really is um, interesting how it can turn. And, and that's mm -hmm. when I think people become like dependent on it because you're not actually being asked to kind of opt into it into the experience. Absolutely. Would you agree that it's, uh, how did you frame it? Uh, what was the word you use? Uh, about I, I, like she'll about, match your energy kind of like, like give yeah, you what you're. What I've been saying recently is it's an amplifier. Would you oh. agree with that? Uh, yeah, I suppose. I, I think I would. I'm trying to think what I, like if psychic, like if mushrooms or psilocybin is like a non-specific amplifier. 
I mean, I guess they all are, you know, I'm just using one. So basically, I, my dad's been getting into cannabis for arthritis and it's really interesting smoking weed now with my dad after him catching my brother and I in high school my and putting us in rehab for just smoking pot. Um, oh my you know, gosh. Uh, so, I don't mean to laugh. That must have been awful. No, yeah, yeah. I, I am laughing about it. Um, uh, what's the line from Dude, Where's My Car? Oh, I used to say it all the time. It was like reefer. No, no, that's sublime song, but it's uh it's like stoners <laughs> or something. I don't know, but they're making fun of them. Anyway, so um yeah, my dad's growing some weed and I have a bunch of weed from a buddy as well. And we're just like trying different strains and this and that. And he's like, how does that one feel? Or this one feels that one. And I'm like, you know, it always feels like it just amplifies the mood I'm already in. So oh. now I never really looked at it before um, until these conversations. And just like a week ago or something, I was feeling down and depressed and whatever. And I was like, I'm, I'm just going to like smoke some weed, you know? Mm -hmm. And I knew I was like checking out and then it got so much worse and so i remember mm. texting my dad just being like all right i just had the same weed a couple of days ago i was laughing i felt great and i was also in a good mood before and this time i was in a bad oh. mood and so that's what i mean by amplifier you know yeah i mean I matches don't... your energy you said the same yeah, thing yeah yeah i um i'm trying to think i mean i really it's so funny the more i work with medicines like the the less i use it all recreationally so mm -hmm. like the the you know my last endeavors with cannabis have been very intentional like in ceremony combined with breath work a lot of the times um and like i absolutely know why i am working with it so does it amplify that yeah but yeah. i am not like oh i'm just gonna smoke some weed i don't i and i see i like i don't have any issue with that i do like i do enjoy all these Delta nine drinks that are coming out and like the micro uh, microdoser, like uh, the microdose, like breeze. Have you tried that? Wait, wait, wait. Back it's a up. drink. Okay. What, what's Delta Sorry. nine? Delta nine. I don't know. It's like some a form brand? of THC oh, okay. that um, is some, it's apparently hemp derived. So it's like gone through this loophole so you can sell it nationally. Okay. Um, and it's put in a lot of like cannabis drinks now. But like there's this one company and it's only 2.5 milligrams of My cannabis. Favorite. Yeah. Um, in a can. So that that's way enough for me. But for some reason, it doesn't have the same like full body. And it's also combined with lion's mane, which is nice. And so it's just like a better glass of wine. And so I've really yeah. been enjoying that. And I can't say that it's amplifying anything. I'm just kind of like, that's like a nice treat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I totally, I see. A couple what you're times saying, a week yeah. versus like smoking some weed and really getting stoned. Yeah. I don't it, know. That's funny because I, I typically have worked with the two milligram weed mints. I'm like, it, I just yeah. like very, like a microdose of weed, you know? Right. I hate, yeah. 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 <laughs> But then my buddy, um, this guy that comes to my men's group, a good guy, totally good guy. And he was like, hey, I don't know if you uh, are into weed, but my buddy has uh, gave me a whole bag of weed because you know, whatever reason. And I'm like, oh, flower? You still there, Tracy? I think I cut out for a moment. Oh, sorry. My dog was barking. Oh, we're good. Cool. So long story short, um, he offered to give me some flour. I'm like, I'm, I'm all right. I, I don't really, you know, I just do weed mints. And then he's like, well, you know, just in case uh, you could roll a joint or something. I'm like, dude, I don't even know how to roll a joint. Right. So we had a, uh, now when I tell people that they're like, how do you not know how to roll a joint? You're stoner. You're, you were a stoner. I'm like, other people would roll a joint, right. like your pipes or bongs, you know, right. there's other right. ways. So he put on a joint rolling class for myself and another guy in our men's group. And then I just started practicing rolling joints. So then that guy, then it turned into a habit, like, well, I guess I need to smoke it. You know? Oh no! <laughs> you know, so yeah, was, that'll get you into trouble. Yeah. But it's not, you know, I, I don't have a long history a recent history of smoking as much. And even though it is harsher on the throat, everything else, I do like the joint because it is like that microdose. It comes on yeah. quicker and then it fades away quicker as well. So yeah. it's cool. So anyways, just to kind of tie a bow on all of this, <laughs> the original archetype we have is moms or just, um, yeah, moms that are wearing this mask, it could be mm. uh, toxic positivity or something else showing up in the way they 
think and feel and have been conditioned to mm -hmm. to show up in the world since mm -hmm. you lead moms mom on mushrooms i'd love to hear from you kind of uh to unpack that a little bit more yeah i think um it's becoming a lot more pervasive as we grow as a community but what i'm really seeing is this resistance to being uncomfortable mm -hmm. um and um and a resistance to well, to being uncomfortable and then a negative connotation to feeling your feelings if those feelings aren't love and light and rainbows and unicorns and like euphoria. So a lot of times we'll get women who come in and they're very excited to start microdosing and, um, you know, have a lot of expectations around, hold please, I'm sorry, my dog is barking. Good. I'm so sorry. Tiny Chihuahua oh, in the forest. <laughs> um, she, they come in and they, they have all these expectations for how and what they want microdosing to do. And as we were talking about amplifiers, non-specific amplifiers, um, what I think is missing and what I try really hard to do when I talk about why mom is around and what we offer is that you can't feel those euphoria and the love and light and all of the good things if you don't work through the darkness, if you don't work through the shadow, if you don't acknowledge that that is part of who you are and you don't try to like release it. And, and I was having this conversation with someone the other day and we were talking about how sometimes safety can actually feel like anger or sadness or depression. Like that might feel eventually after repeatedness, like that might feel like your safe place is to be sad and depressed. And so what I'm noticing is that there's a lot of shame and anger towards having, having quote unquote negative feelings, whether it's sadness or rage or um, just low or even dark thoughts. And women, mothers judge themselves for those thoughts. And they think either a, the, the medicine's not working. Microdose isn't working. I'm, I'm, right. I have, I'm feeling all this grief. I'm feeling all this anger. I'm feeling all the sadness or B there's something wrong with me. And that's the thing. That's the mask. That's the, the scariest to me is that you are fine wearing a mask of the shadow. And when you take it off and you notice that it's a mask, you actually think there's something wrong with you that you even had it in the first place. And I think that is, that's going to be our great unlearning collectively for all people, but for mothers, especially to say, and this is why it's, you know, it's very triggering when, you know, I used to say this in our comedy show, like, um, you know, sometimes it sucks being a mom and it doesn't mean I don't love being a mother. It means that sometimes it sucks just like everything in life sometimes sucks but we're so afraid to admit that. And we're so afraid to say today is a hard day, or I'm just, I'm not feeling the parenting thing, or I'm overtouched, I'm overstimulated, I'm exhausted, and I don't like it right now. And, and not judge yourself for saying that somehow that also means that you don't like being a mother. Like both things can be true, but that comes back to our reconciliation of our fear of death, right? If we don't reconcile our fear and hatred of the darkness, then we can never allow ourselves to feel that. And you're just going to be in a mask for the rest of your life. I, you know, I have so much respect for moms, uh, whether you're in a partnership, single mom, anything like that at all, because there, there's so many uh, struggles that we all face. But I think it's something that we've all been looking at more as a collective recently is women, right? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, not even to get into some of the politics, because some some thoughts are bouncing through my head. I'm like, no, I don't <laughs> want to pull at that one. Uh, but stay on track here. But the the point being like, I understand and I appreciate all the responsibilities, the obligations, the pressures, the stressors as it relates to being a mother. And my question for you is like when you're working with these women that are beginning to do the shadow work and they don't really have an ex experience of that before and they're feeling like there's something wrong with them or they don't know how to, to sit with these emotions, given that they're are there is so much uh pressure in their life like how can they practically go about 
feeling these emotions so they can move through them. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of it just comes down to good old fashioned time management, right? Like we actually have to have space in our day to feel our feelings. And just like you and I were saying at the very beginning, you know, I was thinking about this when we were talking about like laughing, how we both like logged on and then logged off when we were first supposed to have this conversation, you have to kind of come to a place where you value, Mm. uh, you value the toll that being human takes on you on any given day. And you have to recognize what is like gross self-indulgence or avoidance. And what is just saying, you know what? Today, I just can't, and that's okay. And that is dismantling the superhero toxic positivity archetype and just and and admitting that you actually just are human and we're not always on 24 hours a day or even five days a week. And being able to communicate it in a way to other people who understand that, like that's where kind of healing happens. So from a mother's standpoint, you know what the truth is, is that when you have the flu, and your kids have to go to school and I've done it and you wake up with 104 degree temperature, you still got to get your ass in the car and and drive kids to school and do things that you don't necessarily want to do from time to time. Like that is part of being a mom. You have to roll up your sleeves and you got to do the stuff, right? Kids need to eat. You may not feeling like cooking dinner. You still got to do it. And inside that, mapping out your day and making choices that still allow you to fill up your cup and take care of yourself. And I don't wanna talk about self-care. I wanna say like, are you actually nourishing yourself? Are you eating enough? Do you value sleep? Or have you bought into the martyr narrative that says like somehow you're not supposed to have sleep for 15 years of your life? Like that's you buying into programming that is false. And you're putting on that mask and you're using sleep deprivation as an excuse for adverse behavior when you don't value what it can do for you. Are you not taking your vitamins? Are you not going to see the doctor or nutritionist? Or like, are you not going outside? Like those are things that you're avoiding because it's actually allowing you to feel better. And we have to make time for that as mothers. We have to value that just as much as we value showing up for kid conferences and going to doctor's appointments and all the other things. You have to value yourself as like a a human woman. And um, I think from that place, you, you start to have space to feel your feelings. And that's when microdosing starts to work. And that's when medicine starts to work because you're not cramming it in, in micro seconds in between mm-hmm. phone calls and car line. Yeah. Right. Uh, like if you have a microdosing protocol, you could take the time to, you know, say a prayer or draw some Oracle cards, whatever your thing is and, and do a little bit of breath work meditation and know that like, Hey, I'm creating the space to drop in intentionally have my journal here. I'm going journal. And that is self-care. I, I love you read my mind. I was going to ask about self-care <laughs> and, you know, so we're going to wrap up here in a moment and maybe this will be something we get into a third (laughs) podcast with. Right. Uh, But self-care is an interesting one because there seems to be a movement now where there are uh, advocates for women advocates for moms talking about self-care that very much includes mental, emotional, spiritual health. But for the traditional way we think of self-care, especially like I'm a guy, right? What do I think of self-care when it relates to women? I'm like bubble bath, wine, you know? Manny Petty, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. uh, Yeah. And this is the thing here, like, you got to make time for both, right? Because you need the time to unplug in a lot of ways that still processing your mental and emotional health. You may not be going into it intentionally, and it, but this is, we don't really have time to unpack this, but for me, speaking from for myself, like if I'm going to be binging Netflix and eating ice cream and laying on the couch, I'm going to do that and I'm going to release the shame and guilt on that. And yeah. that is the difference between numbing and distracting and avoidance. It's like, I have the awareness around this. This is what I'm doing right now. And I will move forward, but I'm not, even though I'm avoiding, it's a temporary or temporarily avoiding it. So anyways, rant over. Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, like, 
my family with like Friday night movie night is like church for the three of us. We have very low social batteries. You know, my husband and I give it our all in service all week long. We're both entrepreneurs. My daughter is an introvert and a very soulful person. And by Friday, the teas are fried and it is pizza and movie and ice cream on the couch, legs draped over each other. Like, love it. You know, jammies on at 5 p.m. And that I know our why for that yeah. <laughs> it is healing, you know? So I love that you, it's all about knowing your why. Like, okay, I'm going to, and we're supposed, like humans are supposed to feel pleasure, right? Like we are yeah. here. We're not deer. Like we get, we created ice cream in Netflix and we should enjoy it. Just, just make good choices, you know, <laughs> like know, yeah, totally. know why you're doing it. And I will say, and then wrap this up, like, it kind of goes back to like the goddess and and overthinking it, right? Like we actually write into our foundational course at Moms on Mushrooms. Part of the coursework is to take a bath. And I'm mm. not talking about a bath that needs like rose petals and, you know, the perfect bath, whatever tray and this whole setup and eucalyptus leaves. Like I'm just saying like put warm water with some Epsom salt that you get from Costco into a bathtub and lay in it lock the door you're at home no one's gonna die and stay in there don't bring your ipad and watch a movie hmm. relax and let the water do the work and give yourself a moment to breathe and i that i would say myself prioritizing baths was probably step one on my spiritual journey like that taking baths changed my life it took me 10 years as a mother to allow myself to take a bath and it took many weeks of my family walking in on me when I was meditating or just being like, can I, my, uh, mom, like, what do I, you know? And until they finally learned that everyone's going to live while I'm in the bathtub and it's changed everything for me. It's my reset. It's easy. It's affordable. And it's not self-care. It's priority. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm a better mom when I take a bath. And, and that's what I think we try to teach a mom. And I think that's the difference of mask wearing for even self-care. hundred percent. And I, I love that so much, especially the piece of not bringing your phone in. So rapid fire real quick here. So pizza night and ice cream, favorite pizza, go-to pizza and go-to ice cream. Always margarita pizza and mint chocolate chip for life. There we go. Tracy, this has been so much fun. Thank you again for making the time to come on the Soul Seeker podcast. I appreciate how you're showing up in the world. It's great to collaborate with you and we'll keep it going. And uh, thank you so much. Listeners, go to the show notes and you can find all the ways to connect with Tracy and the previous episode as well, if you want to check that one out. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate you. you got it. Thanks, Tracy. Bye.